All right. Good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks to all of you for being here uh, to spend the day. You know, we do this once a year, and uh, uh, it's, it's, um, it's an honor to come together like this and uh, just, just talk about our Christian faith and also how we apply it uh, in everyday life at the workplace. So I just want to say uh, thanks to all of you who are present here. Thanks to... Uh, Okay. Thanks to Ratna for that session. Where is Ratna? Oh, okay. Thank you, Ratna, and uh, thank you, Ramya, for these testimonies. I really appreciate you know just hearing these uh, amazing stories, amazing testimonies, and uh, thank you for doing that. I uh, also want to uh, take a moment to thank uh, Melki Melki Zedek, who heads up our Christian Professionals Ministry. Thank you, Melki, and the team. The core team, let's just appreciate them. Uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you for, you know, just hosting uh, this for us and all the other things that happen um, as part of the Christian professionals. Um, thanks to all our volunteers and church staff serving here today. We'll just appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you, guys, uh, for doing what you do. We really appreciate you uh, helping us have this. All right, um, before we uh, I just get into what I want to share with us, I just want to point us to uh, resources that the church has. Um, you know, when we come together in a conference like this, you know, we just have a day to spend. Uh, of course, there are a lot of questions that we come, and you know, we, uh, there are each one of each one of us have come, uh, hoping that certain aspects of our faith at the at the workplace would be addressed. And uh, sadly, at the end of the day, uh, today. Not everything is going to be addressed because, you know, you cannot do that in uh, three sessions or four sessions. Um, but I do want to point you to uh, some of the resources that we have um, uh, on our church website. We have some books that are related to the workplace. Um, uh, Timeless Principles, Women, Women in the Workplace, a Work, Its Original Design, and Attitudes Towards Work. So if you go to our church website, you can find these little books there that, that will help you. Uh, also, we have a professionals page, so it's apcw.org slash professionals, where uh, all the previous uh, conferences, uh, sermons that are related to the workplace are available. It's all put on one page. So if you go there, you'll find these uh, resources available and you could use them. And I also point you to our church app. In the church app, we have a toolkit section and then we have... Uh, um, now we have one section that's called lifestyle uh, that addresses a lot of things that you know that we de- we would deal with in the workplace. So again, uh, all these resources are there in case you don't have your questions answered today. You know, you could I would encourage you to go make use of these resources um, that are available from the church website. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to uh, spend some time uh, wanting uh, getting us to think about how we could be salt and light in the place of work. So I just titled this session as uh, the practice of being salt and light. How do we practice that? And of course, uh, we'll get started by reminding ourselves of what the Lord Jesus spoke concerning us. He, he told us in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, uh, familiar verses. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And if salt loses its flavor, then it's not good for anything. You know, throw it out, trample it underfoot. It's pretty harsh, but <laughs> that's what happens when we don't have any flavor. And then he said, verse 14, you are the light of the world. And so you don't, you know, a city that's, uh, that's you know, has lights turned on, it cannot be hidden. There's absolutely no way. You can't hide it. You are the light. You've got to be visible. You've got to shine. And then he told us, you know, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That means our light ultimately is pointing people to Jesus Christ, to God, our Father. So that's, you know, and I think it's such a beautiful way that Jesus captured this. You know, he's using metaphors. You're salt, you are light. And you and I need to Think of ourselves like that. You know, we are salt, we are light. So when you go to work, beautiful pictures to take with you. Salt, light. I'm here to be salt, I'm here to be light. And 
you know, just to, if you want to capture the effect of salt and light, I mean, I, I like to put it like this, salt permeates its environment. You know, so it's just a very, very quiet process of diffusion, just, just permeates into its environment. And then the effect of that is it flavors and preserves. So salt permeates. It's very, you know, it has a very gentle picture, you know, sort of diffusing quietly. People don't even know it's happening, but it permeates its environment. And then it has the effect of flavoring it and also preserving it. You know, we use salt to preserve food uh, in many ways. Light, on the other hand, is more dynamic. Uh, you know, light penetrates or it, it dispels. So you turn on the light, darkness doesn't stay around to argue. <laughs> it's light comes on, darkness leaves. It's very penetrating or very forceful in one sense. It dispels. So while salt permeates or diffuses very gently, light is a little bit more forceful. It penetrates and it dispels darkness. And the effect is it, it, it illuminates and it reveals. So when it's dark, you can't see what's there. But once the light comes on, hey, things become visible. The illumination has come. You can see things. But on the other hand, it also reveals all the dirt that's there. You know, which when it's dark, you don't see. You don't see the dirt. You don't see uh, the things that need to be cleaned. You know, but when light comes on, it not only illuminates, but also reveals. So you are salt, or we are salt and light. So imagine in your workplace, as salt, you are quietly diffusing kingdom influence where you are, and you are flavoring your workplace, and you are actually preserving things. Right? We'll talk about that a little later, but just get the picture. And as light, there are times you're forceful, you're dispelling, you're penetrating, and of course, you have a good effect. You're illuminating, letting, you know, and then an illumination can be uh, uh, used in so many ways. You're showing the way ahead. You're letting people see things. But you're also revealing, revealing the things that are not right, but also revealing who God is in a, in a good sense. There's another very interesting parable that Jesus spoke about, which I think is very relevant for us as we talk about, you know, being believers in the workplace, in the marketplace. Um, in Matthew 13, one of the parables he shares is that about the wheat and the tares. I'm not going to read the whole parable, but if you want to just uh, summarize it, he said, you know, there was a man who had this field, and he went and he sowed wheat in his fields. But then, later on, his, his workers found out that there were also tares growing in that same field. So they come to him and say, you know, we are finding tests. We went and sowed wheat, but we're finding also tests. Do you want us to go and pull out the tests? And he says, no, an enemy has done this, but don't pull out the tares. Uh, because if you pull out the tares, you'll, you might destroy the wheat. Let it all grow together. Harvest time, we'll get the harvest, then we'll destroy everything. So his disciples go back and say, you know, okay, you gave us the story. We understand the story, but what is the meaning? What are you trying to get to us? So later on, Jesus explains, and I've just put two verses there, verses 37 and 38. He said, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. That means he's referring to himself. He, he used the title, son of man, for himself. So he is, Jesus, is sowing good seed. But then look at the next verse. The field is the world. The field is the marketplace. It's the work, you know, any, everything that's in the world. It's the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. That's you and I. Good seed are the sons of the kingdom. So you are good seed. You are a son or a daughter of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the 
wicked one. Now, we don't go and tell people, hey, you're the son of the wicked one. <laughs> That's not the point. But the point is, the good seed, the sons of the kingdom, are in the world alongside the sons of the wicked one. And we have, it's, that's the way it's going to be. And he says that's the way it's going to be, it's okay. Let it be. And while you and I are there alongside all the others, we've got to do our part of being sons of the kingdom or children of the kingdom. We've got to do our part of being salt and light. That's the way it's going to be. It's only going to change at the end of the age. But till then, the good seed is going to be alongside, or the wheat is going to be alongside the tares. The sons of the kingdom are going to be alongside the sons of the wicked. We're going to be there in the world. But while that's happening, we have to represent the kingdom. We have to be salt and light. So, how do we practice this? You know, how do we practice being salt and light in the workplace? And I think, you know, related to this, there are two big questions that all of us have as, as believers. One has to do with practice, one has to do with influence. The practice side is, how do I practice biblical principles? Biblical values in the workplace? And that's a big question. How do I practice this? How do I, you know, I know integrity, honesty, you know, things on leadership, and, so, and also all these things are in the Bible, but how do I take that and live it out? How do I practice that in the workplace? That's, a, that's part of the question. And the other part of the question all of us have is how do I bring influence? How do I bring the gospel? How can I be missional in the workplace? You know, how can I touch lives and bring them into God's kingdom? You know? and, and these are wonderful questions for you and me. And that's part of the reason why we are here. Because we want to learn more. Uh, we don't have all the answers. But year after year we come back for these two very things, to learn more on how can we practice, how can we bring kingdom influence. And the reason we have to do it year after year is because the world in which we are living in, and I'll be talking about that, is changing, it's so dynamic. So some of the methodologies of last year may not apply to this year. I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm saying may not. Some of the approaches we took two years ago or five years ago may not be the approaches we should be taking today. Why? Because the world in which we live is changing. So that's why we keep coming back and asking the same questions. How do I practice being salt and light? How can I practice kingdom principles? How can I bring kingdom influence? And we need to keep on thinking and rethinking and reinventing our methodology, our approach to the workplace. And hopefully, you know, uh, each time we do this, God will give us fresh insight. God will give us new ideas and strategies so that we can be relevant in today's world and practice and influence the world in which we live. So I want us to take a little bit of time to understand the post-pandemic workplace. And many of us are familiar with these things, but I just talk about a few of them. Because our, our, our approach to being salt and light has to be relevant to our workplace. You know, uh, uh, but what is the workplace? It's always good to understand what's going on in the workplace. What has changed? Uh, and some of these changes that we'll be talking about are not necessarily because of the pandemic. They were long time coming, but they have been highlighted after the pandemic all the more. The first thing all of us will talk about is the hybrid workplace. You know, we, we are always asking each other, are you still, in, are you, you know, still working remotely? Are you, at home, are you back in the office in person? But that's a big transition for us. You know, before we were used to seeing people in flesh and blood, shaking hands, looking at their smile, and it was so wonderful. And then we were forced to work remotely. 
And now, very interestingly, we don't want to go back, for most of us. We somehow enjoy this remote work. And so companies are struggling. How do we get people back? And we can't force them to come. And so we have taken a middle ground called hybrid. <laughs> you know, yeah, we'll be a few days at home and a few days in person, whatever. You know, all companies are doing different things. So we are in this hybrid workplace. You're meeting with people, but it's remotely, it's online. Uh, we do get to see people occasionally. And so the whole dynamic of our interactions has changed. Because you're not really seeing the person eight hours a day. You might see that person for 30 minutes on a call or, or on, a, on, a, on a video call or on a, on a some, whatever, however you're interacting. But that person is, you know, uh, is part of the whole work environment, your work environment, but it's not the same thing as being able to go up to their desk or, and talk to them. It's very different. So how can we influence people when you don't even meet them? Or our actual interactions with them are digital. Email, maybe a video call. How are you going to influence them for the kingdom of God? How are they going to see your values, or that you're taking a stand remotely. Uh, it would have been different if they saw it in flesh and blood in a situation. But that opportunity is not there, or is very, very minimal at this point of time. Another major change is that the workplace is now both international and intergenerational. I mean, you're, and most of you understand that. It, it was somewhat, you know, there prior to the pandemic, but now it's even more so because you're not, you know, you could be working, you're part, you could be part of a team that is working with other teams all over the world. And now it's taken for granted. So it is international. You're sitting here, you're working with people all over the globe, across continents. But what is very really interesting is the workplace is intergenerational. Now, you can quickly identify in which category you come in. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is of interest for sociologists and others who study uh, humanity. Uh, they categorize generation in every 15 years. So the most recent set of generations, the baby boomers, you know, between 46 to 64, the, the Gen X, uh, the millennials, the Gen Y, and the centennials, the Gen Z. And then, of course, there's Generation Alpha and Generation Beta when you come on in later, but they're still in the cradle or yet. <laughs> so we leave them out. As far as the workplace is concerned, this is what you have. You have in the workplace, you've got four generations. So you could be sitting at a table and you've got four generations of people. You could have four generations of people interacting and trying to address problems. Now, sociologists do a lot of study on these things. And, uh, but what's interesting is even management schools study these things because this impacts the dynamics. This impacts the interactions. Now, what I'm going to share with you, of course, are general, generalizations that have been made. There will be outliers for, every, every, uh, for all of these things. So uh, you will meet people who don't necessarily fit into the generalizations, but the generalization says most of the people are like this. So when you talk about the baby boomers, for them, the main thing that they value is stability, they value the family, the work, and the family. And the baby boomers really understand the importance of blending physical and mental activity. So they're not people who grew up with the cell phone. Right? It was something they slowly transitioned into the digital world. They saw this whole thing emerge. They saw the technology and the media uh, 
move, you know, revolution emerge. And so they, they kind of moved in, but they were not born with it. They're not dependent on it. For them, they value still the old uh, things of stability and family, uh, work and family, and, you know, physical, uh, enjoyed that, that whole life. And they've adapted to the, the technology and the media that has come on. They not depend on it. The Gen X, they, they came just prior to the whole technology and media revolution. Uh, the, what are their values? They value work. They value to work and produce. To work and produce. Work and produce. That's the philosophy of the Gen X. Uh, individualism, ambition, and an addiction to work characterize Gen X. Individualism. Work hard. Produce. It's about you working hard. Be ambitious. So on. That's the Gen X. The characteristics of what we would call as the, the attitude and behavior patterns of each of these generations. And then you have the Gen Y. They're referred to as the as digital natives because just as they came on the scene, the internet became very dominant and they transitioned very quickly into that. And technology became part of their lives. And this generation kind of got accustomed to multiple screens. The previous generation had a TV. Now Gen, Gen Y, we're talking about Gen Y, had multiple screens. But this generation, uh, this generation saw globalization. It began, that became a norm. They're very optimistic, but this generation, the Gen Y, was also the selfie generation. But it also means that this generation was narcissistic. It was all about themselves. So, Sociologists will refer to this generation as the me, me, me generation. Just focused on themselves. They want to achieve their goals. And in some ways, they're also very lazy and spoiled. That's the Gen Y. And they make up about 27% of the world's population today. And then you have the Gen Z. Uh, some of them have moved into the workplace, those in their early 20s. And this generation is, this very, is very dif different. They are all about transforming the system. They are all about change. For them, uh, so this generation, for them, you know, technology is normal. They were in the womb, but they were exposed to it. They grew up that, that way. So for them, it's normal. Technology is normal. And this generation, the Gen Z generation, because of technology, they're not so good at interpersonal relationships. Not very good. It's not a, not a big thing for them. For them, everything is done online, digitally. Friends and everything. The whole world is digital. They grew up that way. So interpersonal relation not so important, not, not, not really good at that. But this generation is all about change. They are about helping others. They are about group oriented as opposed to the individualism that we saw with Gen X. This generation, uh, Gen Z, is about group oriented. They care about the environment. They care about social issues. They are, their motto is we are better together. So that's the Gen Z generation. And also their attention span is very limited. <laughs> because of the way they grew up. A lot of distractions, many screens, so on. So now you can imagine in the workplace, you've got these four generations sitting. Their motivations are all different. So the Gen Z is saying, how can we change the system? How can we be fair? How can, you know, how can we take care of the environment? How can we take care of the world? How can we you know, help people? How can, 
how does this matter to all of us? They are, they're very concerned about social issues. They want to know where organizations stand on social issues. So they won't even apply to a company if they don't know their social issue. Where, do you, where does this company stand? Where does the head of this company stand on these social issues? Then I'll decide whether I want to work for you or not. That's Gen Z. Because these things are important for them. So when you're sitting at the desk and, or you know, in a conference room or whatever, discussion, generally these things are in the back of their mind. Whereas the Gen Y is thinking, what's in it for me? You know, he's all about me, 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 me. That's the Gen Y. What can I get? How can I achieve my goals? Uh, you know, I, I'm ambitious. You decide what you want. As long as I get what I want, I'm okay with it. That's the Gen Y. That's how they approach things. And then you have the Gen X is looking at the other two and saying, these guys are so lazy. They don't work hard. <laughs> That's the Gen X sitting out there and saying, why can't these guys work hard? They don't know what hard work is. They want an easy way out. Yeah. And most of these are managers. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking at... <laughs> The Gen Y and the Gen X, and hmm, I need to teach them how to work hard, you know, because that's how they grew up, hard, the hard way. They worked hard and reached where they are. And people, you know, the baby boomers who are still around, still in the workplace, are like, okay, you guys do what you want as long as I am stable and my family is fine and I get to do my exercise. <laughs> you guys do what you want. Now they are sitting at the table making decisions. So the workplace has become intergenerational and everybody is coming from a very different perspective. How do you communicate? How do you bring influence? How do you present Christ? Just a couple of things. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Oh dear, it's already 12.40. Okay, number three, there is a big culture shift. This is huge. This is huge. This thing, culture shift, is all undercurrent. Nobody talks about these things in the workplace. You're not supposed to, for the most part, but it's there. The culture shift. Religious fundamentalism, locally, no, it, it may not, people may not express it in the workplace. But the moment you say, I'm a Christian, they think, mm, better watch out, he's going to convert somebody here. <laughs> they don't say it, but it's there undercurrent. Things have changed. You know, maybe 20 years ago, you could have a prayer meeting in the workplace. Today you say you want to do something. The first day is, this, how many people is he going to convert? Say, I want, to have a, I want to invite some friends to have a Christmas thing. Oh, converting. It's a religious fundamentalism. There's a rise of nationalism, whether it's make America great again or make in India or make in China, whatever. You know, uh, each one wants to put their country first. Uh, and, 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 you know, the whole dynamic is around that. Uh, Many in North America, Canada, America, are worried about immigration, migrants. So they won't tell you in the face, but they're afraid you will end up on their shores. It's there. And uh, they're struggling. How do we address it? How do we deal with this? Now, they're not, they're not going to talk to you about it because it's not something to be discussed but it's weighing heavily on their minds. It's an undercurrent. Then there's the whole issue of diversity. Got to include everybody, everybody in, mixed bag. <laughs> uh, and if you are, you know, in the HR, you're going to struggle with this because, hey, you know, I've got to make all these people feel welcome. And even whether I like it or not, whether I approve it or not, this is the policy of the company. And, uh, you know, 
uh, and sometimes it's pretty odd. You're talking to a person, you don't know what is the personal pronoun to use <laughs> to address the person. You go fill up the application, they ask you to tell you what is the pronoun by which we must call you. He, she, him. What else? I don't know. <laughs> it all make, makes the whole workplace very awkward. The good old days, it was just he and she. <laughs> Pretty simple. Now, you don't know. And you can't tell by the name. It's pretty awkward, but that's part of the workplace today. And, uh, you know, North America and most of Europe are actually post-Christian. You'd think, you know, America was Christian. They're not. They're post-Christian. That means they've gone through it, come out on the other side. And you can't assume that somebody who has his name may be John Christian, but he... He's an atheist. <laughs> so don't assume he's a Christian. Don't go by his name. He's post-Christian. So North America and Europe are post-Christian na nations. They are post-Christian. Maybe 30 years ago, it was a wonderful thing that if you said, I am a Christian... Or if you bowed your head to pray before you ate a meal. Wow, they would respect that today. No. Christians are looked down upon. North America and uh, Europe. There are political upheavals. Uh, and we can talk about that. And misinformation. All of those things going on. So, why is this important? Because this is on the minds of people that you're interacting with. Nobody's talking about it, or not of these things, but it's on their minds. And it taints their interactions. Can't avoid it. It's there. It taints their interactions with you. The sad thing is, they won't tell you. Now, I, I was speaking to, uh, uh, and this just happened to me, you know, somebody had come from the US. He started talking, he started sharing his political views. I immediately you know where he stood. And what I did, I said, I don't want to engage with this person. He's a man of God, but I don't want to have anything to do with this person. I didn't tell him that. Because that's not a conversation we want to get into. But I know I don't want to engage with him. Because of those things. So I'm not going to tell him because it's unnecessarily going to give in to all kinds of Thing. So what do I do? Okay, 10 more minutes. I haven't started. <laughs> uh, I just, let's stay away. I don't want to waste time in those kind of conversations and engagements. You know? So that's how it is. All right, I need to finish up in 10 minutes. Number four, mental health is a big thing. Uh, it's a big challenge. We're all aware of it. Number five, there is the great resignation. All right, this started off. I guess around the early part of 2021, but May 2021, huge amounts of people intentionally left the workplace all over the world. North America, China, Europe, India. 2021, one million people left the IT, just the IT space in India. One million people resigned, gave up their jobs. 2021, last year. So it's referred to as the great resignation globally. People are leaving the workplace. Why? For several reasons. Um, mainly, uh, uh, the one is because of the work from home situation. And now when companies said, please come back to work from, they said, no, we don't want to. So we will go and look for jobs where we can still have flexibility, do our own time, do our own work. So that was one of the driving factors. But another very important factor, what, what this great resignation, you can study it, and what it teaches us is that now the power, there's been a power shift. Power shift has moved away from the employers to the employees. Employees realize they can dictate things. I can find the job I want to. I can sit in Bangalore and I can work for any company in the world. So, 
there's been this great resignation, a great shift. Um, and secondly, what, is, what this teaches us, the great resignation teaches us is, people have moved away from focusing on paycheck and promotion to meaning and purpose. So people are not after paycheck and promotion. I'm not saying that's not important, but that's not the focus. What the great resignation is telling us is, people are saying, I want to do what I find meaningful and what gives me purpose. So I'll, whatever it takes, I'll do it. And I can find that myself. So people are moving away and, and this is what it means uh, if you look into what it all is. So, okay, right, too much time, but five, five things about the current workplace. So the question we want to answer in two minutes is, <laughs> how do we practice being salt and light in such a workplace? The workplace is so different today. How can we be salt and light? Let me try to do this quick. So we said, salt permeates. I mean, it's very gently you're bringing your influence. It flavors and it preserves. How can I do this? And then I'll just you know, give you these. Okay, God bless you, Mac. <laughs> Well, he's given me 10 minutes extra. I hope everybody is okay. Any problems? Talk to <laughs> Okay. So, how do we do this? So, you know, you, whatever organization you're working, whatever situation you're working, uh, like we said, the workplace has changed so much. The people are, people are coming in with problems, with all these things behind them. Uh, you are interacting with people globally. Uh, you're working. You're inter you may be interacting with people remotely. Uh, you may be seeing them maybe you know half a day in an entire week. So how can you still be salt? You know, given all this context, okay. I want to just share these few things with you. Number one is to live authentically. If you study what's happening, people are tired of the facade. People are tired of doing things for the sake of doing things. They want meaning, they want purpose, they want the real stuff. So live authentically. They need to see you are genuine. And especially the Gen Z. That is, we're talking about the early 20, you know, they're just coming into the workplace. They are people, they are no-nonsense people. They want the real stuff. They want to see authenticity in you and me, right? If you say it, you've got to live it. It's not like you, tell, you say one thing, it's double standards won't work. They'll go... They'll, they can direct, dictate their own path, so to speak. They're not dependent. Remember, there's been a power shift. 20 years ago, the employee was at the mercy of the employer. No longer today. The employee is not at the mercy of the employer. If he, if he doesn't see you know, authenticity, he'll go somewhere else. Where it, there's something that's genuine. Meaning purpose. So we have to embody that. Secondly, present Jesus instead of Christianity. Because like we said, especially in the post-Christian world, I'm sad to say this, but Christianity as a religion has got a bad name. After all that has happened and all that is going on. So we have to say, I'm not, I'm not here to promote Christianity. I'm here to talk about Follow Jesus. Be a follower of Jesus. I'm not asking you to follow religion. I'm asking you to follow Jesus. That we have to distinguish. Because Christianity as a religion has done a lot of hurt and hurt people. So people are disillusioned for many reasons. But 
we can present Jesus. And everybody loves Jesus. I mean, we love Jesus. They respect. You can't point a finger at Jesus. So in the workplace, if conversations arise, our goal must be to point people to Jesus. Yeah. So salt permeates, it flavors. And one of the ways we do it is by affecting the culture. And how do we affect culture? Replace bad ideas with good ones. Just think about that. It's very simple. How do you affect the culture of your workplace or the, you know, where you're engaging? Replace bad ideas with good ones. So in what's happening in your workplace, when there are discussions, when things are happening, what should you put forward? Ideas that bring truth, that bring fairness, justice, those things. Replace bad ideas with good ones. You are going to be affecting culture. You're flavoring your culture with what comes from God. Number four, show real love. I think we, Ratna already mentioned that. Show real love. That means care for people. Right? In the workplace. So we always ask, hey, what's up? Everything's fine. Usual answer. <laughs> How are things going? Everything's fine. Yeah. And then that's usual talk. But then, when they see that you really care for the person, that means you're going beyond how are you doing, what's going on, to having a conversation, willing to listen to them. Especially, you know, all of us have gone through whatever we've gone through. And when you listen to people and, 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 and show love, that's going to make a big difference in their lives. And address people's needs in Jesus. Right? You show them how Jesus can meet their need. So you're pointing to Jesus. You're not pointing to Christianity or an organization. You're addressing people's needs in Jesus. So how can I permeate? How can I flavor? How can we bring this saltiness that preserves into our workplaces. Think about these things. Live authentically. Present Jesus instead of Christianity. Transform culture by replacing bad ideas with good ones. So real love. Address people's needs in Jesus. That's going to make a difference. Okay, you're with me so far? Okay, uh, we could talk about scenarios and examples, but maybe in the Q&A section, time will we'll, 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 you know, do that. I'll get ready to close here. The second part is light. What does light do? Light penetrates or dispels. Light illuminates and light reveals. How can I do this? Stand for truth. Right? So, integrity, honesty, those things are very important. It's not easy sometimes, but you stand for it. Say, hey, my work, I'm going to do it with honesty. If you, I'll do my work well, but if you tell me to do something that's dishonest, uh, unfair, illegal, unethical, I will not put my hands into those things. So you're standing for truth. Now that's where light is dispelling darkness. It's a little forceful, but you do it gently. You stand for it. Show respect without personal compromise. So somebody comes with different values, Okay, 
I'll respect you as a person, but I don't have to compromise my own stand. You want to take that stand? It's okay, I respect you. You're a person, I will respect you. And you're free to have your ideas, you're free to have your opinions. It's okay. But I show respect because you're a person. But I will not compromise my own values. Now how you live that out in the workplace is you know, it's case by case. There's so many scenarios you can think about. But that's a general guideline. I respect you, but there's a line where I won't compromise what I stand. But I respect. You're free to have your own. Number three. Ratna touched on it. I think I copied his slides. <laughs> uh, be excellent. So Jesus said, you know, be light. Let your light shine. That they may see your good works. And then glorify your Father. So literally, our good works, when we do it with excellence, are actually pointing people to the Father. So, you got to be excellent. Go beyond the call of duty, which is going to be, you know, like when we look at the whole, the, 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 the behavior and the attitude of different generations, like we said, the Gen Z is not that kind of a generation. The Gen Y definitely is not. And so, for you to say, I'm going to go beyond the call of duty is going to immediately you know make you one of those people who stand out I'm speaking in terms of the general generalization but it'll make you stand out you're going beyond the call of duty and it's going to point to the Lord speak truth and love we need grace for that All right, we could uh, take time to think about these things and you know the scenarios behind each of these how to apply it but I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to do that uh, just two more slides and I'll close uh, so Isaiah 60 our theme scriptures for these uh, this conference this year I just want to point out it's the glory of the Lord that will be on us so even dark even though darkness covers the earth look at that verse 2 that amazing promise so even though the world is dark Yet the Lord will arise over you. And his glory will be seen on you. And the result is verse 3. Gentiles will come. That means people are going to be drawn. People are going to be, there's going to be some sort of a magnetic pull, if you will, through our lives as we arise and shine and we let God's glory be revealed through us. Though the world is dark, or the darkness is deep, yet there's going to be some sort of a pull through our lives that even the Gentiles will come to the light that is seen in our lives. So that can be our prayer. Lord, when I go to my workplace, through my life, let my colleagues, let the people I'm working with, let they be drawn to the light that's shining through me. That's to the Lord. Amen. Another beautiful prayer, I close with this, is Psalm 90. Uh, you know, the psalmist said, Lord, let your work appear to your servants. Let your glory and your glory to your children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be on us and establish the work of our hands. Look at verse 17, very interesting. God's beauty, our work. Think about that. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be seen through the work of our hands. It's pretty amazing. Let the beauty of God be seen through the work of our hands. Now, whatever we do, and may that be our prayer, that God, when I go to work, whatever I do, let your grandeur, let your excellence, let your beauty be seen through my work. So, People are drawn to the Lord. They're attracted to Him. Amen? So, 
Let us practice being salt and light. Salt permeates, salt flavors, salt preserves. Light penetrates, illuminates, and reveals. That's who we are. We are salt. We are light. Amen?